Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Um, today we are going to be discussing the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power SDCC Comic Con panel and as well the trailer that was released alongside with that uh, panel. Um, now this is the second version of this video that I have made. I made the first video um, the day the trailer came out, just after watching it. It was very incoherent. I tried to pull my thoughts together. <laughs> it didn't quite work. Um, and I also had not watched the, uh, the Comic-Con panel. And I kind of have a clearer view of certain things now that I've watched the panel. Um, and also, some things have been cleared up uh, since the trailer has been released that I didn't know about when I first made my video. And on top of that, the footage was corrupted and it wouldn't upload. We love that. <laughs> um, so I took the time to kind of just research some fan theories, my own fan theories, one of which I'm sure you guys will find really interesting. I was really excited when I suddenly was like, oh my God, the dots are connecting. Um, and so I'm just here to talk and chat about all things Tolkien and Rings of Power. So I hope you'll stay with me and, you know, continue watching. Um, I do have a singular clip um, of me making that video when I first sat down to make it. So I'll insert it right here. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. The new Lord of the Ring, the Rings of Power trailer dropped the SDCC trailer and <laughs> I am literally losing my shit. I have not been this excited about the show until now. I mean, so I don't know if you can tell, I was really, really fucking excited. Um, overly excited. Um, that video would not have been the best to kind of discuss what was going on. Um, make yourself a cup of tea. I have my Hobbit Tariel mug that I got from the Hobbit shop, which I am pretty sure is no longer a thing. I'm very sad about it. I loved the Hobbit shop. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. I made a whole list of notes that I'm going to be reading off of and kind of expanding on. And the first one is that I am so, so, so excited that Bear McCreary and Howard Shore are working together on the film score for this TV show. TV show score? It wouldn't be a film score. Um, Howard Shore's music for Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit has impacted my life in such a way I can't imagine life without it. I am always listening to the soundtracks um, and I'm sure many other people, multitudes of other people can say the same that those film scores like changed their life. Um, so I'm so excited when I was watching the, the, the panel um, and uh, McCreary was talking about how, you know, he took a lot of inspiration from Howard Shore and that Howard Shore uh, did collaborate with him on some of the music and the, also on top of it, Howard Shore composed the main theme for The Rings of Power and apparently, and I quote, it will make us cry. I never thought I was gonna get new original Tolkien music from Howard Shore and I literally cannot wait to hear it. Um, they also had an orchestra that opened up the panel and played some music from the show and it sounded really great. Um, I'd like to see the scenes in the show that is connected with that music, um, but the music did sound really, really good. And so I am really excited because music is such a huge part of Tolkien. There's so much music and song in the books and especially in the movies. It's part of that iconic iconicness that we've expected from Tolkien on film is the music. So I'm really excited to see that um, the Rings of Power is going to be continuing that epic music that's really going to pull us all in. Um, now Stephen Colbert did like um, mo like moderate the panel, which we love it. I love how he's been involved with all the Tolkien, you know, films and all that. It's so funny and um, he's a great moderator. 
Um, so he was talking to one of the showrunners and he's like, is there anything you want to say to open the panel? And one of the showrunners legit just pulled out like an entire paragraph of fluent Elvish and just spoke it. I don't even know what he was saying. They didn't provide a translation, uh, but it sounded flawless, flawless Elvish. And my jaw kind of dropped. I'm not going to lie. I was like, okay, so... And this ties into another point I'm going to be making um, later on, but it was really cool to see that the showrunners feel the same way about Tolkien as so many of us hardcore fans do. I know they've been receiving a lot, a lot of criticism. A lot of people are saying that they're not real Tolkien fans, but watching this panel really drove it home of how much these showrunners, these two showrunners, really care about Tolkien and watching them just casually just say a whole thing in Elvish was like really really cool. <laughs> this kind of ties into my next point um, where uh, Stephen Colbert asked Benjamin Walker if who is the guy who is playing uh, Gil Galad um, and said like did you do you know the poem about Gil Galad and he just straight up recited it like Gil Galad was an elven king, of him the harpers sadly sing. That whole poem, he just recited it. This is the kind of dedication that I am so happy to see coming from these actors. It really warms my heart to see that they are putting in the same effort that the previous casts of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings put in to play these characters in such a beloved world. Um, I got goosebumps. I was so excited. I was like, yes, yes, show them that you know that poem because it's a very important poem. Um, and it was just really cool to see. And both of those two points pull uh, tie into my next point, which is um, it's really weird to me the way that fans of Tolkien are talking about the actors and the showrunners like they aren't also fans of Tolkien. Um, you're entitled to your own opinion about the show, but to say that someone else isn't a fan because you don't agree with their interpretation of Tolkien is just so arrogant and so wrong. The amount of people I see going, oh, these showrunners couldn't care less about Tolkien. They're just trying to, you know, make a cash grab and all these actors are blah, 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 blah. Like they don't care. It's very obvious that they do and that most of them have personal connections with Tolkien's works in their own lives. And those that don't are making those personal connections to Tolkien's works now. It was the same with Lord of the Rings. Not all of the actors in Lord of the Rings had read any of the books until they were on, you know, in the movies and then they read them. And I think it's very elitist and arrogant to decide that because you don't agree with someone's interpretation of a work that they don't have the right to call themselves a fan. That is just so wrong and you have to have such a massive ego to be like, well, I'm a real fan because I think your interpretation is wrong and I know how it should really be done. This is just someone's vision of Tolkien. And I think we really need to remember that. The Jackson films were Peter Jackson and Philippa Boyan and the rest of them. That was their vision of Tolkien's world. And The Rings of Power is a new vision from different people that they are trying to tie in to Jackson's vision so that we get a sense of continuity for the film world. But it is not going to be the same as the books. It can't be. And that's okay. And I think as long as it is well done, there is no need to be throwing insults and calling any of these people fake fans and that they don't truly care about Tolkien's works. I think that is just such a, a blanket statement. And again, so arrogant and full of ego and it's just really disgusting behavior. Um, and I think that a lot of these people, if they would watch, you know, interviews with the actors, the showrunners, maybe watch this Comic-Con panel, 
um, they would see that, you know, these people have personal connections with Tolkien's works in their own lives. Tolkien means a lot to these people, just as Tolkien means a lot to you. And it's no one's right to go over, to pride themselves as being a better fan over another fan. Um, and so I think we just need to remain respectful, even if um, you don't like their interpretation of Tolkien. I think it's important to still remain respectful. Going off of that, uh, the actress who plays Disa, uh, Sophia Nomvet, I think that's how you pronounce her name, um, has confirmed that Disa does in fact have a beard. And I'm so excited. One of the other people on the panel um, said that each hair is placed individually on her face to make it a realistic beard and I'm just so excited I'm so excited I was really worried um, that she wasn't gonna have a beard uh, because at least to me it's important that the female dwarfs have beards now I am currently reading the nature of Middle-earth where it is specified that female dwarfs do not have beards however I think that the Tolkien fandom has come to expect female dwarves to have beards. And so I think it is good that they have continued with that, um, uh, that stereotype that female dwarves also have beards. Um, and also, so Sophia was just so excited to be playing Disa, to be the first female dwarf on screen to have a character and a character arc and an important part to play and not only that but she is the first dwarf of color and that is just so exciting and she is lovely and I am so excited to see how she plays Disa in the show. Um, Disa's characterization is one of the things that I have, am finding myself more and more just so excited to see on the screen and the fact that we now know that she is going to have a beard I just, it's gonna be perfect. I'm so excited. All right, so getting into the trailer, the very first thing that we have is a voiceover from Gladriel, and we also have a scene of her placing a helmet, what appears to be an elvish helmet, um, on a massive pile of other helmets. And the landscape around her is burnt, it is ruined, it's smoking, it's destroyed. And to me, this does look like it could be the aftermath of the Nirnith Arnoediad um, or the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, um, where the casualties for elves were was extremely high, extremely high. Um, and this would be a very poignant scene um, to see her grieving like that. Um, and also, it would be another First Age flashback, and I am all hands ready, like I am, what's the... All hands on deck? No, that's the wrong phrase. I'm just so ready to see First Age flashbacks. I love the First Age. I love the Silmarillion. I'm currently rereading it. Um, and it's just, I'm just so excited to see flashbacks to the First Age on screen. Um, so if we do get to see the aftermath of the Nirnoeth Arnoidiad, that is just going to be so cool. Let me get a shot of an elven city that in a previous video about the Rings of Power I had said I thought was Linden. However, I am now convinced that this is actually a Region um, because after um, we see that shot, it's the same shot of the city that we have seen in uh, previous trailers. Um, we get a scene of dwarves and elves sitting down at a dinner table eating together, and this would insinuate friendship, um, which then does bring to mind the friendship between the elves of Eregion and the dwarves of Khazad Dum or Moria. Um, and I'm very excited to see this friendship uh, play out. Um, we've had hints of friendships between elves and dwarves in the previous movies and in the books, but nothing really um, substantial. And so it's really going to be cool to see that tentative allyship um, between the two races uh, in the Second Age. shot that's been kind of controversial, but honestly, I'm kind of loving it. Um, and that is a shot of Tamriel and Galadriel um, in front of a palantir. And I am convinced this is a palantir. It's round, it's circular, it's a crystal. 
what else is it gonna be? It's a Palantir. Like, there's literally nothing else that looks like that in Middle Earth. Um, and so Galadriel touches it and she has visions of what looks like flashbacks to the First Age, some really massive battles, um, possibly the Battle of Sudden Flame when uh, Melkor uh, or Morgoth put out the dragons for the first time with Glaurung. Um, and then she also, there's a scene of her next to uh, her brother, Finrod, who is dead and she is crying. And this is gonna be important for a theory that I have figured out later that I'm gonna mention later um, in this video. Um, but yes, Finrod is dead. This is probably a flashback. Um, so keep that in mind. We get confirmation that the white blossoms that we saw Tarmiria looking up in the teaser, looking up at in the teaser trailer, is in fact what we thought it was. It is the blossoms of the white tree falling, which is such a good metaphor that Tolkien has employed in his books. Um, so the white tree shedding its blossoms is a metaphor for evil and corruption taking root in Numenor, and the white tree looks beautiful. Um, very, very excited to sort of see that um, tie into true Tolkien lore right there. Um, and I'm excited to see that um, our suspicions were correct because some people were saying that it could be ash. Personally, I thought it was the blossoms of the white tree. It looked too uh, soft and white to be ashes. Then we have a shot in the trailer that turned out to be quite controversial in the day or two after the release of the trailer until we did get clarification on who this person was. Um, so we get a shot looking up at a cliff and there are three figures standing. They appear to be in very fancy ceremonial clothes. And then we get a close up of one of these uh, characters and everyone, myself included, thought it was Sauron. Um, and everyone was very upset for the most part because this character has a shaved blonde head, looks very, very creepy, and has such a strong resemblance to Eminem that it was actually upsetting. Um, I was looking at it going, how is this character supposed to be Sauron. Sauron is the master of lies, the master of disguises, you know, the great deceiver. How is he going to deceive Celebrimbor and the other elves looking like a Middle Earth version of Slim Shady? How is that going to work? It's just not. You take one look at this character and you're like, yep, that's a bad guy. <laughs> um, turns out it's not Sauron, thank God. Um, it's actually a woman cultist of Melkor on Numenor, which is really, really interesting and way better than this character being Sauron. Um, because Sauron was taken captive and taken to Numenor where he instilled corruption, deceit, and kind of tore the island apart, resulting in the fall of Numenor. Um, and I think this would be a showing a sort of a cult of Melkor if if An uh, Sauron, um, you know, starts a cult dedicated to Melkor, Morgoth, that would be a really great way to kind of see the seeds of that corruption kind of dig its way into Numenor. And, you know, this person does look like a, look, look like a cultist, so it would work perfectly. Um, and yeah, I think that's way better than this person being Sauron. Clearly, we still have no confirmation on who Sauron could be, which personally I think is a very good um, direction to take the show. I would really love if we as the audience had no idea who Sauron is, because again, he's the master of disguises. Um, and I would love to be just as deceived as the elves. I mean, we will kind of figure it out because he shows the elves how to make the rings, but up until that point, I would like to be in the dark as to who Sauron is. When he is in his Anatar form, he is supposed to be beautiful and amazing and, you know, you're not supposed to feel that he's evil. So I would really love to be kept in the dark 
uh, for as long as possible as to who Sauron is. Then we get this, then we get to a part where my theory comes in and so we see um, lightning and these three sort of peaks um, in the background and I was first thinking, when I first made this video, I was like, ooh, is this Autumno? Is this Angban? I don't think it's either of those. I actually think it's Tol in Goroth, which used to be Tol Syrian before Sauron took it over and turned it into a den of wolves. Um, Finrod was buried there. Luthien destroyed Tol in Garoth and made it clean, clean again. She cleansed it until Morgoth took it over again after the Niranoeth Anoediad. Remember how we saw, we saw Finrod lying on top of what could be a tomb, dead, Galadriel crying? What if she's going back to Tolingaroth to search for answers? Her brother's buried there. It would make perfect sense. That was Sauron's fortress in the first and second age until he, um, you know, built um, Baradur and then also his fortress in Mirkwood. Um, that was his first fortress. That is where Finrod is buried. So I would be so excited if this was actually the case. I would think that that would be so cool. Um, and I haven't seen anyone mention this. So if you know you have any thoughts on whether or not you think this could be the case, I would love to know. Um, because again, before I kind of um, was researching into what this could be, I really did think it could be a Tumno or Angband. Um, but this just makes way more sense, way more sense. Um, so I'm really, really excited about this. Then um, on Twitter, I saw a really fascinating theory um, that three, three characters that were made up for the show, um, they go by the names Hullbrand, Kemen, and Theo, are actually going to become ringwraiths in later seasons. And this is supported by evidence that the sword that Theo holds, the one that um, kind of, it's it kind of smokes back to life, like there's smoke and it kind of fully appears as a full formed sword, looks remarkably like a Morgul blade. And also Morgul blades when used disintegrate into smoke. So I think this would be really fascinating, like an early version of a Morgul blade, except that when you hold it, it turns into a sword. Um, I think that would be really cool. Um, and it would make a lot of sense for these characters to be, you know, um, ring wraiths. As far as we know, we have no, we don't really know why these characters are in the show. Um, they are made up for the show, so it would be a really great way to justify including them is if they do become ring wraiths in later seasons. Another thing that I want to talk about before we get to the biggest surprise of them all that was at the end of the trailer, I'd like to talk about the orcs um, and why I love the design for the orcs. Um, if you notice, all the orcs are very, very covered. Um, in previous movies we have seen, the orcs have very little clothing, um, very little armor. It's all very, you know, they, they have a lot of skin showing. Um, but the orcs in this show are very, very covered in very loose fitting clothes. They have their heads covered. They, um, when we see them, they are under tents. And this is really important because up until the uruk and Sar um, Sauron's orcs in the Third Age, um, orcs couldn't go out into the sunlight. Uh, it was really, really painful and very, very bad for them. So they didn't go out into the sunlight. So to see these orcs covering themselves, hiding from the sun is a really cool attention to detail that I am just loving, um, especially the tents. It makes so much sense. 
if they're not able to live underground, like let's say they live um, in a terrain where they are not able to live underground or in mountains like some of their goblin cousins do, um, to live in tents to block out the sun is such a great idea that I didn't even like think of. Like, what if you're an orc who's allergic to sunlight, but you don't have the ability to live underground? A tent, you know, it makes perfect sense and I'm really excited about it. Okay, finally to the last part of the trailer that truly got me, had me literally screaming, had me fall on the floor, I was crying, I was choking, I was screaming, throwing up, about to throw myself into a road in front of an oncoming bus. Um, <laughs> And it was so unexpected too, which is why I had that kind of reaction. Um, at the very end of the trailer, um, you know, it kind of looks like it ends because you get the blue uh, prime screen. And you're like, okay, the trailer's done. And when I first watched the trailer, I that's where I paused it and like put it down because I thought the trailer was done. And then I was online doing my little scrolling and I saw people going, oh my God, there's a Balrog. And I was like, I didn't see a Balrog. Did I miss something? So I was going back and I was re-watching the trailer and I'm like, I don't see a Balrog. And then I just let the video finish playing those last three seconds and oh my God, the Balrog <laughs> looks so good. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. The Balrog looks so freaking good. It is an exact replica of the Balrog that we see in the Fellowship of the Ring. The only difference is it doesn't look like it have wings, but it could be that the wings are just folded up on the back and it hasn't kind of like put them out yet. And this could be confirmation that we will see the fall of Kaza Doom Moria in the show. However, though, I hope that the fall of Numenor and the fall of Kaza Doom don't happen in the same season. There is the issue of the compressed timeline. So I'm not sure how this is going to work because I am fairly sure that the fall of Moria takes place first. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to have to... One second. I'm going to look this up. I can't remember. Okay, so I'm back. Done a little bit of research. The fall of Moria takes place in the Third Age, 1981. And the fall of Numenor is in the second age, 3,300 and I'm blanking on the last two digits there. Um, but basically they take place a long time apart. However, with the compressed timeline, um, it is very possible that we could see both of them. Um, it's just the inclusion of the Balrog has me nervous as to why that would be there in the first season if Numenor has to fall first, why would we be seeing a Balrog so soon? Unless we're gonna get the inclusion of other Balrogs, which is a theory I have seen as well, that this isn't actually the Balrog from Moria, and in fact, a different Balrog because there is no wings. So it could be a completely different Balrog that we're gonna see you know, come out from somewhere else. Perhaps it's in a flashback. Either way, I'm just really excited. It looks literally spot on. The continuity, you guys, the continuity. They didn't change the design at all and it looks fantastic. All right, so that was my thoughts and opinions on the SDCC Comic Con panel and the trailer. What did you guys think? Do you have any thoughts, any opinions? What did you think of my theory that the uh, abandoned evil looking fortress that we see is in fact Tolin Garoth and not actually Angband or Atumno? I'm really excited about that one. I, it was like a light bulb went off. I was like, oh my God. Um, so yeah, let me get let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. I would love to know. I love discussing Tolkien with other people, even if our opinions aren't the same. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Navar, silo anor